So today we're going to begin recurrent neural networks. And uh, we've already kind of touched upon recurrent neural networks a little bit in the last few weeks. We already kind of, a lot, lots of you have already been using these char RNNs and LSTMs to make text and stuff. Uh, but we haven't really talked about uh, very much about what they are or how they work. Um, so today I'm going to kind of introduce them and lay them out a little bit, uh, ex explain a little bit about like their theoretical underpinnings and then talk about different kinds of applications of recurrent neural networks. Uh, once you get out of the sort of char RNN box, you, you start to see that these things are actually very, very powerful. And um, they kind of go in and out of being, um, uh, of being the favorite method for doing various things, but you'll see that they have lots of really, really neat applications that we haven't uh, gotten to see just yet. Okay, um, just a little bit uh, about the next few weeks, like the schedule. Um, so today we'll do RNNs, and then next week we'll be kind of like a little bit about natural language processing and some audio applications. It's kind of like a bunch of miscellaneous stuff um, that we haven't been able to, uh, that, that doesn't quite um, fit in any of the other weeks that we've had. And then we'll be on break during the week of Thanksgiving, um, I, and I'll be out of town that week, so we'll kind of um, work our way around office hours and things like that. And then when we get back, we're, we'll introduce reinforcement learning, which should be really, really exciting because, um, well, that's kind of like the pinnacle of uh, machine learning stuff. Um, and I want to gently prod you to begin to, you know, think about projects and things that you want to uh, begin to explore for these last few weeks. Um, it, it's, it's still early, but uh, we have looked at most of the content uh, in terms of like the practical materials that you'll be able to use. So um, this is definitely a good time to begin to, to maybe just um, think about those things. And what I'd like to do is to try to get a chance to talk to everybody, you know, maybe before Thanksgiving, uh, ideally, about, you know, what you're thinking. Uh, yeah? What's your date for Delphi? It's December 11th, I believe. Yeah, so that'll be the last week of class. Um, also, uh, so we just arranged this yesterday. This we this Friday at AI Lab, uh, we'll have Irene Alvarado, who is a um, creative technologist at Google right now. A good friend of mine. Uh, worked a lot in TensorFlow JS stuff, as you see. Um, so that should be really really good. I hope everyone can come by for that. My office hours will be um, tomorrow and Thursday, one to seven. Uh, just please email me uh, about arranging a time. And like I said, I'll be uh, at the week, uh, so right after next week's class, um, I'll be out of town for about a week, and that runs into Thanksgiving, basically. So it'll be more like 10 days, more or less. So, so it's a good idea to try to maybe chat a little bit before then. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have ideas. Okay, so let's talk about RNNs. Um, so, so far, all of the neural networks that we have uh, covered in any great detail are examples of what we call feed-forward neural networks. And what that means is all of the information starts in the input layer and goes out forward into the output layer and then doesn't, and that, that's it. It's kind of forward, one forward pass. There's no recursion, there's no loops, there's no, there's no going backwards, um, you know, and more or less like uh, all of the different kinds of layers that we've seen, so convolutional layers and, and uh, fully connected layers, they're all examples of feedforward layers in neural networks. And you can kind of encapsulate your conception of a feedforward neural network with the diagram on the right, right? So this is like the ultimate black box, right? You get an input called X and it goes through a, uh, this module, this yellow module here, which is the neural network. And the neural network is characterized by you know some number some uh, number of layers of weights so you're basically multiplying x by w whole bunch of weights and you get y on the other side right that's what a feed forward neural network is now um, these things have some disadvantages right so what are some of the shortcomings of feed forward neural networks so one is that they they don't ever they don't they can't change they're they're very static and we know that in um, you know, in real life, most intelligent agents need to have some way of adapting to their current circumstances. And a trained neural network has really no way of easily doing that. Now, there's like different kinds of hacks. There's sort of semi super, or there's sort of online learning contexts that do change over time. Um, but for the most part, they don't really have any 
way of dealing with uh, context. There's no notion of context. That's kind of the second line there. There's no notion of paying attention to one thing rather than another or um, changing your behavior in response to some new, uh, some new information, right? So these kinds of things are, are really not, uh, feed forward neural networks don't have any, any way of, of uh, working into their normal functioning. And the other thing is the inputs and the outputs are always fixed size. So, you know, an image has some number of pixels and a, um, you know, whatever it is that we're dealing with, it always has to fit into a single vector. And we're going to see that we're going to be able to break these assumptions with recurrent neural networks. So if feed forward neural networks are what you see in the left, recurrent neural networks are kind of what you see on the right. And this is the ultimate black box here as well. The idea is that instead of having just the series of weights that we multiply x by, we actually multiply it by some hidden state, which we'll call H for the time being. And the hidden state is effectively kind of the, uh, works the way that we think of the weights right now. Um, it's not exactly true because the weights are, you'll see in a moment, the weights are inside there. Uh, but basically X gets projected through the hidden state and out comes Y. And then when it does, the hidden state changes. And in, in, uh, the hidden state is a function of the previous hidden state and the input. Um, I'll, and we'll, we'll break this out into more detail in the, I think in the next slide. Yeah. Um, so, but, but just, just to get this clear, like the idea is that every time you push one piece of new information through the recurrent neural network, it's hidden state changes and it's hidden state changes in response to whatever it is that went through it. So in the, we, so this is the way we think of time in this case, time is just kind of time steps. Every time you push uh, a new input through the network, it goes to the next time step. Um, you don't have to necessarily uh, pay too much attention to the, like the details of this, but like this is a, this is the simplest kind of re recurrent neural network that you might have. Is that it before you know like uh, okay this I don't have my I wish I had my cursor. How do you turn the cursor on in Keynote? Does anyone know? This is really is there like a option for doing that? Google. All right, screw it. Okay. Anyway. Um, so that first equation, right? Imagine you didn't have the, um, you know, h t minus one. It was just f of x, right? That's kind of what a, a, an ordinary neural network is like. But now the this hidden state is a function both of its uh, the, of the prior hidden state and the uh, present input. And it, uh, and and basically what that ends up being, if you break that formula out, the second line, is that you get. The 10h is like some activation function, right? And we've we've seen like sigmoid and ReLU right now. 10h is another one that, that is actually quite common in recurrent neural networks. 10h is is kind of like sigmoid. It's this kind of sigmoidal curve. Uh, it's a, it's um you know, t uh, <coughs> um, but in any case, like it's a 10h of a weight a weighted sum between a uh, the prior hidden state and the new input. And you see these whh and wxh. Those are your weights. Those are the trainable parameters of a recurrent neural network. And so um, they get added together. And then there's another, uh, yet another set of weights that is multiplied by the hidden state um, that gives you y, more or less something like this diagram. And they get increasingly more complicated, but that's like a, that's like a, a simple example. Ultimately, like if you don't want to go de deep into the, into the sort of the structure, the mathematical structure of this, the, the, the takeaway is that um, the hidden state changes in response to x. And, um, and y is a function of the hidden state, right, and x. So how would this work in time, right? So you have this recurrent neural network. It gets an input. And then you get an output, as before, um, as usual. And, uh, but now, in the next time step, we can, we can kind of copy this, right? In the next time step, h of one is actually not just uh, is not just receiving information from x of one, but it's also a function of, of the prior hidden step. So these kind of unroll in a sense. You can unroll them through time, right? Uh, this is kind of unrolled through time, and they can go indefinitely, right? So they they're just um, they have the same structure all the time, so they can continue indefinitely into into the far future. So like a simple example of this, and this is what we've been doing with CharRNN, is you can train a recurrent neural network in order to model uh, these uh, sequences of characters. 
uh, text characters. Now, how, how would we model characters uh, numerically? As, uh, in, because, of course, neural networks accept only numbers, not characters. So how do we model characters? So this is very typical, and we've talked about this before in the context of classification, but these, uh, the way that you might model a character is as a one-hot vector. One-hot vector means that the number of possible characters you have, you have a vector that long, and it's all zeros except one for the character that it happens to be representing. So A, the character A would be one, zero, 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 and so on. H would be, you know, zeros, and then the, whatever the H index is, the eighth character or whatever, is one, and so on. Um, uh, yeah? What, what, you called it a one what? Vector? One hot vector? Yeah, one hot vector <laughs> means like a vector of all zeros except for one somewhere. Um, so the way we might... Uh, like what if we, if we want to create like a, uh, a char RNN right it's a, a, what is it like a char RNN ultimately like because we, we kind of see it in this as a little you know magic box that that samples characters but ultimately what it is is a, a neural network that can predict the next character given a sequence of prior characters so um, the way that this would be trained is that we want to be able to so like let's say our sequence is hello world Right? We want to train hello world. Then we would set it up so that it t accepts an H. And then we want the network to predict E for the next character. Then, oh, I had, oh, there we go. Yeah, like H, you know, we want to predict H to E, E to L, L to L, L to O, right? And what this actually looks like internally is that whenever, once you, get this prediction, it doesn't actually predict the character. What it does is it gives you a probability distribution over all of the possible characters. So you might input an A, H, you know, one, zero. If, if our characters are H, E, L, and O, right, we'll, we'll input an H. It'll go through the network and it'll give us probability values. These are actually like, these are not probabilities. These are uh, log probabilities, so they're not normalized, but, but these could be norm basically normalized through softmax layer. And then basically this would, you would say, okay, E has the highest probability, so we'll sample that. We'll say E is the next one. Then we take the E and project it through the network again and get a new set of probabilities. And we'll take the, we'll take the, the, the next, you know, the highest value. And it actually gets it wrong here, right? So sometimes it'll get it wrong. Uh, or no, actually, no, it is correct, right? So L. Um, in any case, um, so yeah, we get probabilities. And from the probabilities, we can sample, we can sample the next character, right? So like, um, the, and the way this is trained, right, so is is basically by unrolling all of the the sequences through time, and then back propagating through the entire sequence, and then that magically, as we've seen before, um, is able to model the sequences like very very effectively. Um, and uh, now, of course, we there's like. You've probably learned in other classes at ITP, like for example, you've probably worked with Markov models, right? Markov chains. And Markov chains are another way of modeling sequences, probabilistically, right? But Markov chains have a, um, have a fixed, like um, basically a fixed memory, right? Whereas theoretically RNNs don't. Now effectively they also do because you just can't, um, you can't hold information indefinitely. We'll see with LSTMs, they improve this, but in theory, there's, they can unroll you know, as far back as you want. Um, and, they, and because they, per, this hidden state persists, it's essentially, in some sense, like uh, remembering all of the information that it's always had. Um, it has a sort of like diminishing effect, like the farther back in time you go, but in principle, it's all there. Um, now, um, so that's, that's um, I think this is like slightly out of order. Uh, Right, my slides might be like slightly jumbled today because, because I, well, um, well, I suppose they may be more than other days. But but this is, so some things might be roughly. I probably should have put this later. But let's let's in, introduce them anyway. Now the thing the thing is like recurrent neural networks, um, they're very flexible, right? So in you you might um, you might be interested in um, you know predicting the next character, but you you might be interested in sequences themselves, right? And you can actually have you can input a sequence, which means that like let's say you input a sequence of characters, like a long sequence of characters, then uh, you are conditioning the network to that sequence, right? Because you input 
x. And then h of 1 is now a function of the, of the first input. h of 2 is the function of the last two inputs. Um, right? There's a sort of chain, chain of effects going on here. And then you've conditioned in on some input sequence, and then you can output some, some uh, output sequence for, for, uh, as you want. So like what's, in the, what's a concrete example of this is uh, language translation. Right? So language translation is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem. You have a sequence of words, and you want to translate that into another sequence of words in another language. Right? Now, um, this, uh, uh, the way that this is done um, does get a little, bit, a, a little bit more complex than the vanilla RNN, but not by much. Like basically, you have uh, effectively, like, and this kind of combines ideas from both recurrent neural networks and also we talked about autoencoders before. So, um, and we'll, you'll see this when we talk about sketch RNN also, but the way that you might do this is that the RNN is kind of split into two, into two uh, halves, like an encoder, uh, an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder t is, a, is an RNN which takes some input of, let's say, English words, right? And um, encodes those into some small latent vector. And then that latent vector, goes into a decoder RNN to condition it, and then that decoder RNN samples words in French, right? So, I am a student, je suis étudiant, right? Something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and also you'll see these kind of start and end token characters, uh, which kind of tell, the art, tell us programmatically, like, okay, start the sentence, then end the sentence, so that we can kind of use instructions as well. Um, now, we're going to talk about this a little more in detail next week, but of course, words are also not numbers. And the way that we encode words, like a word level uh, RNN or something like that, is that we use word vectors and word, or, or word embeddings, right? And um, basically, every word is assigned to some vector in space, and that becomes the, the, the input vector for that, for that word, right? And we're actually going to talk about word vectors in more, more detail next week. Um, so that's sequence to sequence. Of course, it also outputs probabilities. You can also have unit to sequence. So uh, you just get a single input, and then that conditions the network, and then the network gives you an output sequence. So what's an example of that? Um, image captioning, right? So you have an image. Your image is a fixed size input, and then that image can actually condition the hidden state of a recurrent neural network which is trained in order to uh, produce a caption describing that image, right? So straw hat, right? And um, okay, so you get this picture of some people playing Frisbee here. And again, you have this sort of encoder and decoder RNNs. The encoder encodes it into some fixed vector. This is kind of a cool idea, like the fact that you can, you can encode an image as a vector which represents that, that image. And it represents it well enough that you can actually write a sentence about it. Um, so it's, it's almost like this, again, like this sort of space of all possible image embeddings um, that, are, that are, you know, um, well, it's, and it's learned in order to sample sentences. So yeah, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee, right? So something like that. Um, a man in black shirt is playing guitar. Construction worker in orange safety vest is working on road. Two young girls are playing with Lego toy. Boy is doing back, flick, back flip on wakeboard. Girl in pink dress is jumping in air. Black and white dog jumps over a bar. Young girl in pink shirt is swinging on swing. Man in blue wetsuit is surfing on waves. Pretty impressive, right? And this is actually already from three years ago. Um, so these systems have, have um, I think, have improved somewhat since then. Um, and again, there's a... There's now there's a convolutional network that's used to... So the way that this actually works in principle is that you have a convolutional neural network, which is, you know, it might be some neural network that was... Again, this is an example of transfer learning. It's a neural network that was trained to do classification, but then you chop off the last layer, and then you just use the last, let's say, the last fully connected layer as your encoding of that image, and then that encoding is used to as a seed kind of to input into a recurrent neural network, which is um, to, to condition it. And then you can sample from that network. You, so you'll, it'll, it'll condition it here. And then there's like, besides for the words, you will often have tokens for various kinds of special, uh, like, okay, you'll have a start and end token, 
right? So start is kind of a special character that's used to say, okay, you can begin to speak. And end is like, okay, stop, right? Uh, because otherwise you don't have any cue to stop sampling. It'll just output forever. Um, and sometimes it's useful to have like a st stopping cue. Um, also punctuation, they tend to be um, their own tokens. So basically you'll condition this network. The recurrent neural will, will take this, this hidden representation of the image plus a start token and then sample a word, right? And then that word, whatever that word is, and, will, and what it'll actually do is gives you a probability over all words, right? And so you have to sample from that probability distribution. And that's something that you have some options over, right? And we, we talked about this with the temperature parameter in char and n, right? What is, the, what is that whole temperature parameter? Um, basically, you have a probability distribution. What's your strategy from sampling from it? You can say, well, I'll always just take the highest probability word. Um, so that's, that's one option, right? Uh, but if you do that, you might, you might get very boring, sort of repetitive, overfit stuff. If you want to give it a little bit of spice, maybe you sample the second prob most probable word or the third most probable word. And the temperature control basically controls this amount of randomness. Um, in, uh, so uh, that's, well, yeah, that's basically what it's for. Um, so yeah, once you sample the word, straw comes down here and then you throw it back in to the recurrent neural network to condition it. And then you can sample the next word, hat. Uh, and then hat goes in and then you get an ending token and you go, oh, that's it, right? That's how it knows to stop uh, outputting more words, right? Otherwise it would just continue forever. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and then, and then this is kind of explaining that, right? You have a neural network which is extracting a feature vector from an image and then uh, conditioning a recurrent neural, uh, the hidden state of a recurrent neural network and then you can, you can output um, uh, word sequences from there. Um, yeah? Um, just a question about conditioning the recurrent neural network. So the recurrent neural network is already trained, it already has its weight, but this image then becomes like as if, if it were text, as if it were the first like 10 words of text, like it sets the hidden state of the recurrent neural network? Uh, kind of. I mean, the, so the way the, these are actually built is that uh, you have, it's essentially like, okay, well, one thing, this is a, an aside. Once you get used to these, you start to think of neural networks as like modules that you can connect like Lego blocks, right? And so you can think of it as one neural network or as two. It's just, you know, one layer on top of another. And so they're actually trained together. They're, they're trained from the whole process of, uh, well, okay, it doesn't have to be, but like if you're doing it right, they're trained from the beginning to go image to text. And so the actual uh, encoding of the image plus the plus the like the recurrent neural network are all trained together in order to do that task most effectively, uh, and so uh, the well, the question you had was like well, the the way to interpret it is that like the the recurrent neural network will accept that it, that vector as one of its you know like we went back to the formula, um, you know imagine instead of instead of having just this you uh, the second line there you also had an input like for the the uh, feature vector of the image, which is con which is multiplied by some weights. Does that make sense? I know it's maybe a bit hand wavy. <laughs> um, now uh, I think we'll end up talking about this a little bit more detail next week, but like uh, but but it's kind of worth mentioning now, uh, and and it's related. Okay, so like this is im to text, right? And this is. Um, these are what are called skip thought vectors, and skip thought vectors are, are um, um, basically uh, they're they're kind of like word vectors, except they are for uh, arbitrary sequences of words. So they're they're basically sentence vectors, or paragraph vectors, or document vectors, and um, you can uh, skip thought vectors can be made uh, in order to you can you can um, train them in order to. Uh, or you can train a neural network to basically produce skip thought vectors conditioned on images. So this is basically I am to text, except um, uh, except it's not necessarily. Oh, let's let's see what is the difference between skip thoughts. I'll have to look back at the paper. Actually, it's been a little while since I looked at this. Skip thought vectors. Well, okay. In any case, I'll come back to that. But what? But it's basically like I am to text for our purposes. And in this case, this was um, this work by Kiros. Um, Jamie Ryan Kiros, where uh, it's a basically a um, conditioned on uh, it's trained on romance novels, something like that. So basically, 
it takes an image of like a beach and it goes we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind so that's kind of a neat neat thing about these that you condition them according to like some corpus of text that you find interesting um samim um samim winninger who did some work with these uh basically like writing poems about random pictures you know of sumo wrestlers and politicians and stuff like that it's kind of neat um, related to this, and I actually showed you how to use this last week, um, but we didn't really talk about it too much, is dense captioning. And dense captioning is basically kind of like a hybrid system that, that does something like im to text except it g gives you uh, multiple captions for images and relegated to various points of interest or like bounding boxes of interest, right? So you have small, a small bowl of sauce, a plate of food, a bowl of soup, a cup of coffee, and so on. And these are basically, you'll get... Um, you'll get you know, many, many, you can sample from this endlessly, right? Um, d different captions for different bounding boxes. Um, and um, w since we already used this last week, we won't cover this in too much detail, but you, but, but, um, you should know that it works in similar principles. Um, I've had my own fun with uh, dense captioning. So like I, like when the software came out, I was like, what can, what's some funny things that you can do? for dense captioning and so you can see that like I thought hey who is this woman she's she has brown hair um, and then I also uh, like basically uh, ran it on video so you guys remember the old like um, these crazy robots from from uh, Atlas dynamic uh, Atlas robots what, what is it Boston, uh, Boston dynamics um, yeah so the what's neat about this of course it's a, a mirror on the wall a glass window, a bike. It's a, it's always like so. It doesn't have robot in its vocabulary, right? Two people on skis. It never says robot. And it's because it's not trained, right? So it has to find the closest thing it can find. This really makes me think of like the apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. It goes crazy when the like the. <laughs> but I want to I want to fast forward to this and I just want to ask like you feel bad for the robot? Do you feel some empathy? You notice the word unk on the unk? So unk is un unknown, I think basically because it just recognizes that that's a word but it doesn't know how to read. Yeah. Yeah, just just keep keep uh, keep messing with it. See how that works out for you later. <laughs> this is my favorite: a bike on the road, a motorcycle. It looks like a motorcycle, right? Um, similarly, I um, ran it on Deep Dream, and we learned that oh, surprise, surprise! There's a lot of dogs, like in Deep Dream. A head of a dog, a green vase, and so on. So I had a lot of fun with these. Um, Dense cap is is kind of is open source, so you you have it there. Um, then okay, now so we talked about image text. You can also do text to image. So that's kind of neat, right? So you can you can basically um, create a caption and then have a neural network produce the image from that caption. And this work, it basically works the same way in reverse. You have a set of, you have a sequence of word vectors that conditions a recurrent neural network. And then that recurrent neural network is, um, is basically conditioning something that is conditioning some generative model, right? Um, of a, uh, and the generative model, okay. Another way to think of it is like, we looked at, you know, DCGAN and all these. Imagine if we took Z, the Z space of this generative model, and we made it so that Z was was literally the encoding of uh, was the hidden state of a recurrent neural network. Um, that's a very very simple simplified version of how these works uh, of how these work. You train a generative model so that its latent space literally is the uh, hidden state, uh, the conditioned hidden state given the sequence of words, um, and that's more or less how these things work. Now they they work in a very limited, um, of course, like limited fidelity. These you know. I mean, these are these are those are really awesome birds, uh, but but don't try to have that bird model spit out a, a fish, because it's just not going to work. Um, but but they're getting quite a lot uh, better, and it's actually okay. So that was StackGAN, 
and then it had its own latent space that we could play with, right? The bird is completely red, the bird is completely yellow. Um, and then an update to that was attention gem. And uh, we'll talk very briefly about attention. That's another really interesting concept in deep learning. Um, in the merging concept, I have a slide about it later. Um, but this uh, basically is an update to StackGAN that, that does a better job on a much wider array of images uh, be because before they were quite constrained to work with like in very limited use cases. So we've seen this already, right? It's, it's you know, takes a sequence of words, a woman is eating a delicious sandwich, and then that conditions a, um, a generative model, some GAN probably, it is a GAN, um, and then that makes a woman eating a sandwich, as you can see. Um, so um, the cool thing is that once you have image to text and text to image, then of course you have all this like opportunity to create interesting feedback loops. And this is actually a former student of mine named Jake Elwes who created this artwork called Closed Loop, which basically just go, it's a DGN. We talked about DGNs earlier. Uh, a DGN then being read by some captioning neural network. And then so it produces an image. The, that image is captioned by something like I am text. And then it goes the other way around. It takes the caption and it produces a new image. And it takes that image and produces a caption. And then so on. It just goes, it just goes back and forth, right? So this produces an image. It goes bird flying in the air. And it takes bird flying in the air and tries to make a bird flying in the air. Sky is blue and clear. Incidentally, Jake worked really closely with one of your cohorts here, Roland, Roland Arnold. Uh, they were they were uh, both in my in, in a workshop of mine in Berlin a few years ago, and they started making stuff like this. Um, so the there's an IM text repository in TensorFlow that I set up on this computer yesterday. So we're gonna actually take a look at that, um, and uh, and I'll show you how to use that. Let me think about whether I want to do that right now or yeah, I think. Yeah, let's do that now. I'm going to show you IM to text. I'm going to do a little demonstration of it, and then we'll move on to Charn. And I'm doing things a little out of order. Like usually we did like the the lecture and then the tutorials, but I'm going to actually just mix the tutorials inside. Um, so we'll kind of do things as we go. Um, I'm going to show you how to use IM to text. This thing is um, um, like uh, okay. So we're not going to train IM to text. We're just going to use a pre-trained model. You can actually run run it on on the MacBook, like the pre-trained model. I set up this computer yesterday to do it, um, so let's let's actually do that. It can run in the CPU because once because just doing training is, is really hard, but like doing just uh, sampling from an image, you can actually do reasonably well on, on the on like a MacBook. Um, and then I'll also show you, show you Scene Scoop, which is um, this repository made by Chris, um, which is built off of IMT text. So let's get out of this and. I have to remember where I put it. Um, so uh, let's go to here, and it's it's I, it's models. So I left some instructions for myself. Um, CD research, CD IM text, and then um, yeah, let's open the instructions. So basically, um, this is the repository I'm using. This TensorFlow models. TensorFlow Models actually has a whole bunch of other stuff in here, which is really neat. Um, I haven't looked at a lot of it, but but if you look in research, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of models, um, some of which might be quite interesting. Okay, they have an autoencoder. Brain coder, that's a new one. <laughs> um, is that for like uh, MRI stuff? Or? I'm not sure. I don't think so, um, because I don't think they were involved in that, but maybe. Um, in any case, we're going to look at the IM text module. And it has in, in, um, instructions on how to install. There's also um, some instructions. Okay, so I'm gonna go to scene scoop. So if you look at this repository that, that Chris has, um, it also links to the uh, this set of instructions that are really nice for IM text. Scene scoop uses IM text the instruction. There's a good set of instructions. Uh, he put he has a link to them somewhere. Here it is uh, by this guy Edward Fouché. Um, who has some instructions on how to set up IM text on a computer? It's pretty easy. Uh, you do have to you ha do have to install a few things like Basil. TensorFlow uses this building system by Google called Basil or Basil, um, and 
And I did have to do a couple of minor things to make this work because I think these instructions are very, very slightly out of date. Um, but I wrote them down in the instructions. If anyone, um, I'll share these. I'll share these online later. But basically, um, this is what you would do from a fresh MacBook. Okay, you got it. You have to set up. X, make, Xcode is probably already set up for you, but then you'll have to install Bazel. Um, oh, I don't have that written in. So like basically, you to install Bazel. It's like yeah. Pit, oh, great. Yeah, hang on a second. Um, install Bazel. This is more or less the instructions for, for building Bazel on, on, on like a Mac. It's, it's, you can do it with Brew if you'd like, or you can just download the binary. I, I downloaded the binary. Um, if you have any troubles with, with because of Xcode, you'll have to just do this first. Then the other thing is you'll have to download NLTK, which is really easy. You'll do this and then, and then you'll open the downloader and then you have to download this, oh, not punks, but punked punctuation model. And basically you would go into this CD models research slash IMT text, and then you'd run this command to build the, the inference module, which, which runs, which runs, um, which generates captions from IMT text. Um, I had to do a quick thing that I found here, basically. Um, it probably should load fine for you, but if you get something that says like, can't figure out what the name of this tensor is, uh, like tensor name not found, then you have to run, then you have to take the, the, the checkpoint and run it through this script here. Um, I know it's a few minor things, but it's, it's not as bad as it looks. Actually, there should be a Docker container somewhere for IMSEX, which will make it a lot easier. Um, but um, if anyone ends up using this and has trouble with this, like just come see me and we'll make, we'll make sure it doesn't like ruin your life to try to figure out how to run it. It's actually not as bad as it looks. And anyway, once then you have to download the model, which there's instructions for here, where to find the model. You put the model somewhere, and then you have to um, you basically set these variables. So we're gonna do this right now, actually. So I'm gonna go here, and basically, uh, let's see here, it uh, basil bin, yeah. So basically, from here we'll go. Okay, the checkpoint there is this. This is where I downloaded the model. It happens to be lying here. I am text model model checkpoint that looks like a normal TensorFlow checkpoint, and then we give it an image, right? So I'll I'll show you what this image is like. So open. So I have these this image that I found online, and then the voc there's a vocab file that tells it where the vocab is. Oh, and I have to input the image file. Um, we can actually look and take a look at the vocab. This might, uh, it's maybe not a good idea because it's really big, but you can look through the text file. It has all the vocabulary in there. Um, I don't think this is necessary actually, but let's see if that, if that, that and then once you've, once you've ran, run this, I already ran it yesterday, so I don't need to do it again. This builds the module, but once you have that, you can now run inference and you can do it. You can basically just do this building model. Loads the model, two cats are laying on a bed next to each other. Two cats are laying on a bed together. Let's try another image. Okay, so like let's call out the weirdest possible image. Like let's search for something. Somebody, upside don't be shy. Down, What's that? Upside down crocodile. Upside down crocodile. <laughs> Let's take this. Crock that JPEG. Let's get another one. One more, one more image. Someone else. What is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Huh? Birthday party. Excellent. <coughs> Birthday.jpg. Okay, so let's try this. Now we'll set the image file to be croc.jpg and run this again. Uh, 
Um, a large brown and white elephant walking across a river. Okay, so it's not, not amazing sometimes. I think it probably got a weird aspect ratio, so because it was a vertical image, and so I think it gets squashed, that probably makes it weird. Let's try the birthday party. Um, birthday. A group of young children standing next to each other. A group of young children standing around the table. A group of young children standing next to each other in the room. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very exciting. Very exciting. This used to blow people's minds three years ago, but uh, now it's just like, what have you done for me lately? You know, it's like, <laughs> um, so uh, our buddy Chris made this really neat repository called Scene Scoop which is built on IM text. And basically what it lets you do is, it lets you first of all do, uh, extract um, a bunch of captions from the frames of any video file. And then, um, and, then it, and then it has this nice handy dandy explorer to like kind of look at them. And it also does this like nearest neighbor retrieval. So like you go, okay, you input a video, it extracts the, frame, the captions from the frame. And then it takes the captions, a group of people walking down the street, and then it samples it from some like data set of movies that you've analyzed. And then you get like the nearest neighbor um, frame of a movie um, uh, based on the captions, like similarity of the captions. The way that it measures uh, similarity of captions is using some sort of a sentence encoder, I think. I uh, actually don't know, what's he doing? Oh yeah, he's using a sentence encoder in Spacey. I think we'll look at Spacey next week. That's a natural language processing library. Um, but in, in any case, like we can actually run this. So basically, cd dot 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 scene scoop. Right. So this is what scene scoop looks like. Um, basically, you have these folders. You have a set of transcripts that he did uh, ahead of time. And basically, what I would do is run the command, where is it, usage, yep. Python scene scoop, you give it the path to a video, right? So I actually, I, um, so I'll do this, and then I put a video here, um, where, oh, let me, let's actually try this. I have, let's, so this is, this is, let, let's do something weird, uh, less weird first, and then, and then have it and demonstrate it. So like, I just have a, a video of myself, What's going on here? Open with, yeah, quick time. So that's just me, right? You guys have seen this, uh, just monkeying around. I'm gonna put that in. Um, let's just copy that here. And then also you go name. So let's give it name, gene face. So it'll basically like uh, take 47 frames. I think it skips every, I think it does one frame per second. And then it'll uh, give us a bunch of captions and it'll generate a JSON file in in transcripts called gene G, uh, where is it? it should be called gene face oh okay so it's still doing it so yeah let's let it load it makes a temporary folder for all the images all right so that's actually those are in here Right, and then basically it's going to, I guess it takes a little little while. Yeah, it's it takes a little while when it's on CPU, obviously. Like I'm running this just with, uh, this is just the CPU version of TensorFlow. So, oh, there we go. Um, so it's not so bad, but it would go a little bit faster on, with a good GPU. So we can open this inside of Sublime, let's say. Um, a man of, a man holding a pair of scissors in his hands. A man wearing a tie and a shirt. Um, a, a woman in a white shirt and black tie. Uh, yeah, not bad. Frame numbers, like these captions are applying to multiple frames. I think that must be the case. Yeah, I'm actually not 100 percent sure. That sounds that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I'd say it looks like that. I was I was thinking it'd be funny to um, run my nips video through this right so let's try that i'm actually kind of curious name nips 
and then so let's let that go and um, actually let's see if the server runs if I go um, get pull because yesterday yeah yesterday uh, Chris had to fix a few things I'm not sure if the server is actually gonna run I had trouble with it yesterday yeah oh because yeah non ASCII character open credentials oh uh, okay maybe if I do this I don't think we really need the uh, these but let's just try oh, okay maybe that is gonna work Uh, not exactly. Okay, this needs some work, but <laughs> but basically your results might vary. I would I would take a look at Scene Scoop. I think it's a pretty cool tool. Um, in any case, let's see here. Let's get out of this. This is still captioning, so I'll let that I'll let that go for now, and we'll we'll kind of like uh, return to the slides in just a moment. So, so yeah, I'll, we'll we'll look at what the NIPS video <laughs> produced maybe before the break. Um, let's just see how we're doing. One o'clock. Uh, okay. So we can. I think we can get into yeah LSTMs, and then we will we'll talk about LSTMs. Then we'll take a break. Then we'll show you how to do char and n for those who don't already know it, and then we'll talk about some like uh, special applications. So, um, so uh, that's that's IAM text. Right, so of course that can be very useful. And actually, I should mention that um, Runway has a really nice IMT text module built into it. Um, they've said that the Runway beta should be ready, like by, I, I think by December. But but maybe they were going to give you guys uh, some sort of a like a pre-beta version. Has, has Chris said anything about that? I'm going to get him on on that. I want him to give you guys a special version of Runway. Runway has IMT text on it, so you can very easily like download it on your machine and then have a camera captioning an image like running in no time like really really easily so you can you can work that into your projects like I would I would definitely consider that um, a very viable uh, tool to use um, okay so uh, sequence to unit is another category of recurrent neural network uses so like one example of that, we're not really going to, we're not going to do this today. I, I think we'll talk about this a little bit more detail next week. So like sentiment classification, for example. So that, what is that? That's a sequence of words, you know, the, uh, a movie review or something like that. And then a classification on the sentiment of those words, happy, sad, angry, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and more or less the, a lot of natural language processing classification tasks are examples from this category, right? Sequence to to unit, right? Um, okay, we saw this. So um, now we get to LSTMs. So so in practice, no one uses vanilla recurrent neural networks. Like that was kind of the original conception of them. But vanilla, when I say vanilla recurrent neural networks, I, I mean like the simplest kind of um, you know equation that that you can make that has uh, recurrence. No one really uses those anymore because they are um, they are not um, well they're they're just we've made a lot of innovations to them right in practice a lot of uh, there are different kinds of recurrent neural networks in in the big family um, that have various properties and in the uh, mid 1990s uh, Jurgen Schmidhuber and his collaborators came up with a type of recurrent neural network called LSTM, which stands for long short-term memory. So um, we're, we're not going to get into the guts of this, um, mainly because I don't fully understand the meaning either. Because, and I don't, I don't know if anyone really does. They're kind of a little bit magical. Um, like I can describe the math to you a little bit, but it's it's not really going to make you any better off. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, so LSTMs are um, okay. So like this top. Uh, by the way, this is a really great post, uh, this blog post by Chris Ola. 
if you really want to understand LSTM, so I would definitely like encourage you to read this blog post and and Crisola's blog in general and Distilled that pub has a lot of very very uh, well written like very accessible uh, content about deep learning. In any case, like a vanilla regular a regular recurrent neural network of this t of this variety, right? You can think of uh, you can think of a lot uh, like this, and this is these are all just different diagrams that are expressing the same thing, right? You have this cell that um, unfolds over time and it's conditioned on two things the hidden state of the prior the the, the, it, the prior hidden state of the cell and the current input and then it goes through some some activation function like normally like a 10 h right in a vanilla recurrent neural network and then that gives you the new h of t which conditions the next the cell at the next block and so on right so same thing right an LSTM is is that except the uh, the internal circuit is more complicated. So now the signal is actually split into four like sort of micro circuits that go through their own uh, different activations. The like there's three sigmoids and one 10H, and uh, then they all get added together and become the hidden state of the next uh, at the next time step. It all seems like super magical, right? But the whole, uh, but the, but to, the takeaway from this is that by doing this, the the this kind of a recurrent neural network cell is given an ability that doesn't really exist very nicely in, recur in normal recurrent neural networks, and the ability is to kind of um, make information sort of almost like freeze information for a little while, like so that it persists. Because, you know, the whole idea of long short-term memory, right, you want to be able to know a certain thing, um, like know a certain feature and, and hold on to that through many, many time steps until it's needed again, right? Because a lot of times you, uh, you like the way that we interpret language, for example, we make connections from words that are very distant from each other, right? So like here's an example. Um, the... Um, the person was from France and he spoke many, many languages, but the language that he spoke best was the language French, right? Well, how did you make that connection? Because we, well, con context, right? We, we brought in the country France many, many words ago. And so it'd be useful if there was like some part of the LSTM or some part of the network, which is kind of like takes that piece of information and tries to hold on to it for a little while. And roughly speaking, that's what these gates are doing. They're kind of like they're like on-off gates that keep that that keep certain kinds of information in a um, I want to say frozen. That's not necessarily the best word for it because you can, in in neural networks are of course continuous functions, continuously differentiable. So you can't really freeze things, but you can like pseudo freeze them. Um, uh, we'll, when we get into attention, this will become more clear. There's also like um, aspects of this. But in any case, like uh, by doing this, LSTMs have better long-term memory. And there's other kinds of there's other um, there's there's different kinds of LSTMs as well. Uh, yeah, this blog post gets into it, and this is more detailed than we need. But like every every example of LSTMs uses different versions of them. They have all sorts of very exotic uh, exotically designed gates. They're kind of like GANs in the in a way. There's like a family of of this particular function that has and and you know different ones have different properties uh, but the ones that we're using are more or less like the vanilla LSTMs I guess you can call them so um, that's so so when we get into char RNN right now we'll get into char RNN um, char RNN is called char RNN but it's actually an LSTM right we're just an LSTM is a type of RNN so that's that's the relationship uh, but char RNN is an implementation of an LSTM who, which operates in sequences of characters. And characters, as we know, are one hot vectors corresponding to letters, right? Now, um, if you want to understand char RNN really well, I would read this blog post by Andre Karpathy in 2015, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks. It's a really, really, um, really, really excellent read and, and, and very accessible, uh, especially like from given the kind of stuff that we've looked at already in this class, it should be pretty, pretty straightforward for you. And it kind of, um, I, I think a lot of the uh, sort of uh, interest in deep learning from artistic circles was was actually kind of to, to some degree kickstarted by this blog post because um, it made a lot of noise on, on the on the internet um, back when it came out. 
And the implementation of ChaRNN was adopted by lots and lots of people, myself included, just kind of trying to put different kinds of things through it um, and see what they can come out. So like, okay, an example of ChaRNN is, is um, training it on the corpus of Shakespeare, right? So what do you do? You get, you get a long text, um, you know, and long being like, like the rough, a rough benchmark is at least a million characters, let's say. So one megabyte of text. That's uh, and that's 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 the bare minimum. Ideally, you have more than that. You know, like a few megabytes or tens of megabytes or hundreds. The, the more you can do, the better. But one megabyte at minimum. And um, so, for example, the entire corpus of Shakespeare is like five megabytes or something like that. I'm not, I don't remember exactly what it is. Um, that's a really interesting way of looking at the length of someone's out uh, of like uh, of a writer's output. You know, it's like Shakespeare wrote five megabytes of of uh, plays. <laughs> In any case, um, um, so, so okay, so like uh, once it's trained on all of Shakespeare, it, it can just begin to produce fake Shakespeare. So this looks like Shakespeare, but it's not actual Shakespeare, yeah? Did they encode the line breaks, or did they make those they, They're encoded, yeah. So there's like a line break character, okay. yeah. So it's usually, you don't have to do that yourself usually because the text editors themselves do that, right? Because they have line breaks. The line breaks are just not displayed, but they're actually in, in ASCII, they're like a slash T, it's like an escape character, slash N. Um, so so they, it actually learns all of that, right? And it learns to capitalize the names of people, right? And it does have names from the actual books like King Lear, right? I didn't make that up. Uh, but if they appear a lot, they'll, they'll actually end up, you know, being memorized. Right, so Viola, why Salisbury must find his flesh and thought, that which I am not apps, not a man and in fire, to show the re reigning of the raven and the wars, to grace my hand reproach within, and not a fair our hand, right? So if you like read it long enough, you see that it doesn't make any sense, but like it does at first glance feel like Shakespeare. Um, and um, it's, oops. and um, it, it, you'll notice occasionally that it makes up words, right? So like, I guess, I don't. I don't think apps is necessarily like a word. Is this is there's, there's actually not too many bad uh, mistakes here. But remember, since it's character level, it'll sometimes like sort of like shift into a different word halfway through the word, <laughs> right? So occasionally it'll kind of fly off the off the handle. Um, you can actually now now basically the way it works is that you the recurrent neural network is training and the way it's training is that it's reading through the text and it's taking blocks of the text <clears throat> and then trying to predict the next block of text from that block right or the next character within that block and and it goes in epochs through the through the entire corpus of text and as it does you can you can occasionally try to sample from it and see how it's doing right so like in the very beginning it doesn't make any sense at all right it's like it's just random characters. Maybe after a few epochs though, like after a few iterations, it figures out like, oh, there's like spaces sometimes. Like you'll have a bunch of characters and then spaces between them, right? It'll figure out basic things like that. Then it'll begin to kind of make pseudo words, you know, things that look like words, but you know, have maybe the right sort of like, um, the right cadences, let's say. <laughs> but aren't actual words, right? Then it begins to slowly get some words in there. Counter, out, one, that, which, right? Better and better and better, right? Then it starts to acquire like quotations and punctuations, and then it begins to get really, really good at, te at, at producing text. Why do what they, 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 replied Natasha, right? Um, this this kind of stuff. So you can measure it as it goes. The really cool thing about this is, and this is where it becomes really clear that these things are much better than than um, than let's say like Markov models, at least in terms of modeling long range dependencies. Is for example, when you try to train it on XML, you'll notice that it it's really good at completing tags. So there's the page tag and there's the close page tag at the end. Title slash title ID slash ID revision. So that seems to imply that it has some ability to like know that it's inside of a page tag, for example, uh, and that it keeps that information so that it knows to close it later. And we'll see this in a, in a little bit in a second uh, when, we, when we analyze the cells themselves. But, um, but that's kind of cool. And that's something that you wouldn't see a, Mar a Markov model do um, it really well. So, um, so, so yeah, Karpathy 
<clears throat> and Justin Johnson, they made a whole bunch of these like really, really neat examples online. Some of the really funniest ones were from that original blog post. So I'm just showing you some of those. So for example, they, they trained it on the entire source code of Linux. The L Linux source code is like, like hundreds of megabytes or something like that. It's really, really long. Um, it's all code, which is really amazing. And so you train a char RNN on it and it begins to make pseudocode. Uh, actually, I shouldn't call it pseudocode because pseudocode means something else, but it makes fake code, right? And it, and it looks really convincing, right? It's like static void do command. This is, looks like real C code. It remembers to like, okay, if else statements, it remembers that inside, it's inside of a loop, right? It even makes up its own comments. Free our user pages to place camera if all dash. Now we want to deliberately put it to device, right? So it's like really, it's, um, it's really lifelike. And then even like, uh, it even memorizes the entire GNU li license. Because if you look at the source code of Linux, all, each, each individual file has the, lin it has the entire GNU uh, license in it. And so it just memorizes that and then it actually can spit it out. Um, they trained it on algebraic topology papers. So this is like, you know, like abstract math. And, uh, and because math equations are, are just text, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a markup language called LaTeX that people might be familiar with if you've ever like, if you've ever had to make equations into a PDF. Um, so like you can actually put these in and it just makes up equations. It's like, and you know, it's indistinguishable from abstract topology, I would say like proof of one. It is also start. We got S equals spec R U cross U cross U, right? Arrows equals. Uh, C discussion of sheaves of sets. There's one, uh, one of the pages that goes proof omitted, right? which is a really, really funny thing to do. It even makes up like bogus diagrams and stuff. Yeah. So this is really, really neat. Um, in the post, they also talk about how you can um, interpret some of the cells, right? So like, okay, what do I mean by this? Remember we did this in the context of convolutional neural networks. We tried to measure, we tried to interpret what the cells what each of the, when I say cells, I meant the neurons, right? Like what each individual neuron was trying to, was trying to detect. So the way you do that is you pass images in and you try to find whatever makes that neuron excited, right? So like one of the neurons, for example, was excited about faces, right? Whenever it saw a face, it would light up, right? And um, so that neuron was looking for faces and some neurons were looking for upper bodies and some neurons were looking for circles and stuff like that, right? Use the same thing in LSTM, right? You can actually measure the uh, the current value of a of a cell within a recurrent neural uh, within a LSTM, and to to try to understand if it's if it's coming up with something if it's trying to find something that makes sense to us, right? Now a lot of them are junk, right? Like okay, and the way they do this, by the way, is that they would feed in a text. They would they would train an LSTM. Then they they would feed. Uh, a text to that LSTM and measure the activations of the of the actual uh, LSTM cells, and then as it's reading through the text, they would color code it, where red is low and then it's uh, red is low and then you know white is high or blue is high or whatever, and um, and then they would for each character that they read the text, they would they would show how lit up that neuron is at any given time. Now some of them are pretty much junk, you know. Okay, like this you can't really see much, but then if you look at this one, right. It's reading, it's a cell that seems to count where in a line you are. So it keeps track of like line breaks, basically. You're sensitive to position in line. So it start, at the beginning of a line, it starts totally blue, and then it diminishes in color gradually. And then at the end here, it becomes really red. And then that kind of is a cue for the network that like, oh, you're getting really close to a line break. So probably a line break should go here really soon. So that's, so that's one cell, another cell, cell that turns on inside quotes. So you get quotes and the cell is on inside the quotes and then goes off immediately outside of the quote. Cells that activate inside if statements, right? If it's trained on code, right? Um, here's another one. So cells that turn on inside of comments and quote, inside of comments of code, right? Cell that is sensitive to the depth of an expression. Oh, that's cool, right? So you have a nested if statement. So it keeps track of how many nest, uh, how many uh, like uh, depth uh, up into the statement that you're in, um, and so on, right? So, right, so that might be helpful in predicting a new line. Note that it turns on only for some of the parentheses. So that's really cool. So, um, 
So, and that, that's pretty neat, right? Like you can actually measure these a little bit. Um, I trained the char RNN on lots of different things. Like when the original repository was out, like I tried training it on state of the union addresses. So I trained one on George W. Bush speeches. So then it goes, this war, we will be the practice of terror. And we have F10, the fastest growing and days of conscience applause. In the forces of success, members of Congress are working on extremists and changing discretionary spending below inflation. It must put strategy from the sound of enterprise of our people. And some spending find them with a momon and determined effort to support New York City. Applause. Because in, in the uh, transcripts, it always writes applause. You know, and you've seen the State of the Union address, right? Where like the Congress has to applaud like seals every 15 seconds, no matter what the president says. So you quickly get that at the end of every statement, basically. Um, I also like, I, so I, this is a little personal, in fact. I, I keep a journal that I basically like log what I do every day. And I've been writing it for like six years, basically. So I have something like six or seven megabytes written. This is already a few years ago, so it was probably only like a quarter of the size. But um, but oh, sorry, that, that's that's the next that's the next one. Okay, so this is my journal, right? Um, so this is like so I it basically like it's making up f fake memories, right? You can read this if you want; they're all fake, right? And, but the thing is, it's like half fake and half real because some of the names in there are actual names of people that I know. Um, or that I've written about, right? Or and some of them are actually made up names. So some names are real and some names are fake. I won't tell you which ones, but um, I use hashtags and tildes to denote like tag words and stuff. And I keep also like uh, GPS uh, and uh, and timing data. And so it just makes up. It like combines my friends from different countries and like jumbles them together into completely artificial memories. It's really really neat. I need to do this again actually because the thing has gotten way bigger. I also trained it on my own email. So you can export your, all of your Gmail. You've written, you guys have all written lots of megabytes of email. So if you can export your Gmail, which by the way is not actually that easy, believe it or not, they don't make it any, they don't make it easy for you. Cause they, they, they put, they give you a gigantic file that has all of the attachments. Like there's no way to have them export without attachments. As far as I can tell, if someone knows a way to strip out attachments, like please tell me because I want to do this again. Anyway, if you can export all of your email, then you can train a char RNN to like write emails like you, right? And this is like, this is poorly trained, so it doesn't make that much sense. You could probably do a lot better. Should I'm happy to be applying of the audio corrects, right? Best gene. Carol has a few hours, right? It, like, it even makes up URLs, like there's links, there's like random slash dot links and stuff at the bottom. Yeah? Uh, isn't that what, what Gmail is already doing with their, their auto uh, responders? Sure, uh, that's almost definitely not doing like char RNN, um, because like if you want to make a serious language model, you don't really do it at the character le level. Uh, char RNN is kind of just like a really fun way of understanding um, how RNNs work. But in practice, like there's no reason to make a language model at the character level. Like you, you really do actually make it at the word level. Um, but but char and ends are fun anyway because they make up words. I think mostly. Uh, yeah, they're probably using some language model, um, but but not not character level. Do we know yeah. if it's personalized or not? Uh, that's a good question. I I suspect right now it isn't because it's probably just not good enough yet. Yeah. Also, I suppose there would be some privacy considerations, right? I'm not sure what their guarantees are. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, my email, my journal, this works in any like other languages. So like I, I threw War and Peace, like the original by Tolstoy into it and it makes up fake Russian, it can make up fake Chinese, make up fake Spanish and so on. Um, Char RNN recipes. So this is really cool. Like people, so people just started putting all the, once Char RNN was online, like people started posting all sorts of really like, like funny examples of it. So for example, this is, um, th this is recipes that you'll find on GitHub, Chinese meat of two or salad. Okay. So like it lists all the ingredients and then, then it gives you instructions, prepare sour cream into egg coloring, drain first pans in the large bowl, Add the flour and seasonings and season with one teaspoon of flour mixture. Add spices, sugar. What's cool is that it uses ingredients that are never listed. And, then it, and it lists ingredients that don't make any sense at all. Like, okay, choc unsweetened chocolate and potatoes. <laughs> and soy sauce. And like, this would be a great, like, this would be a great project to make up crazy recipes and then try to cook them for real. 
Um, this is like this is the this is the true new aesthetic because you know the idea is like you bring in stuff from the digital and, and like like when the deep dream thing came out, this person like made this uh, like this post about like basically she deep dreamed like um, makeup. There was a deep dream makeup tutorial. Yeah, search for something like the deep dream makeup tutorial that no one asked for. Something like that. And so she just drew deep dream all over herself. And this is the same thing. I want someone to like make up char and end recipes and then try to cook them like for real. So get some chocolate and medium potatoes and like, yeah, throw it all in there. Um, friend of ITP, Kyle McDonald worked a lot with char and end. So he, um, he observed that um, emojis or, or just like uh, illustrator files, they're text, right? So you can actually try to run a char and end on text. And then, um, and then basically just have the char and then generate new SVG files and then re-render them as emojis, right? So these are some of those examples. Um, this is a reminiscent of some work by Alison Parrish, I think also, like uh, making uh, random edits into, into emojis. Um, he also uh, trained char RNN on Arrowid. Right, Arrowwood is like a collection of like uh, personal testimonies of like people taking drugs, basically. So this is like, um, yeah. So people like trip reports, basically. So I also saw some sort of manic shaman in the shaman in the face of the spirit of a space which was pumping and clearly shaking and dancing around the room. I felt as if I was on the couch and the real world was being pulled at me. The sensation was still very clear. The surface was obviously intense and not a dream. I felt like I was going to end, that I didn't have a hold of me. I was still awake to the realm of reality. Yeah, that's great. Um, Samim uh, did RNN talks, uh, like, uh, sorry, TED talks, right? The real problem with the death for the universe is the predictions of the size of the other. There's not a problem. They are manufactured by governments to be a choice. So we should really get money at the summit of a male. The reality is that there is a problem and the fish have learned. <laughs> it's like nonsense. Um, okay, other cool things, right? This is really neat. Um, Super Mario levels. So, the, so you can actually like model a level as a sequence of objects, right? So if you can encode something as a vector, you can train a recurrent neural network to make new ones. So, right? so these are like fake Mario levels that were made by a recurrent neural network that was made by this guy, Adam Gatekey. So I think maybe there's some code for doing this. This is really neat. Um, Janelle Shane made up RNN generated ice cream flavors, bloody coffee, strawberry cream disease, silence cherry. I think, I think the, I don't remember, this was like trained on metal bands or something and then, and then fine tuned on ice cream flavors or something like that. <laughs> Peanut butter slime, that's great. Um, RNN generated April Fool's pranks. So April Fool's pranks. Place a pair of pants and shoes in your ice dispenser. Put marbles in the refrigerator. A meat and mashed potato sundae makes for quite the hand soap dispenser. Put a glow stick and a toilet paper into it, yeah. Try using old clothes to pee. Yeah, this is great. Um, former ITP student, Ross Goodwin, maybe some of you know him. Um, he made this um, like RNN, gen uh, LSTM generated definitions. So trained on basically a, a, a like dictionary. And so lexiconjure, um, giving the ratio of the sun and the horizon and the ratio of a limited state of about the same type or condition. Plural, another term for intern. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is, I think it tweets out like a new definition every hour or something like that. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, Ross also collaborated with like basically a film crew to make a movie that's starring the, um, the guy from, um, from Silicon Valley. So have you guys seen Sunspring? How many of you have seen this? Okay, let's... let's get six months free Apple okay. Music on the network you yeah, deserve. Switch now and get $300 off our best phones. Play. So they trained it on screenplays of science fiction films. All of these. And then it wrote a screenplay. It wrote a screenplay for them. And then they interpreted it. And they put actors to it.
in a future with mass unemployment, young people are forced to sell blood. It's something I can do. You should see the boy and shut up. I was the one who was going to be 100 years old. I saw him again. The way you were sent to me. That was a big, honest idea. I am not a bright light. Well, well, I have to uh, go to the skull. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can you take some artistic liberties? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, well, I, I don't know anything about any of this. Any of this uh, uh, <laughs> then what? There's no answer. We're going to see the money. <laughs> All right, you can't, you can't tell, me tell me that. Yeah, I was coming to that thing, you know, because you're so pretty. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think that's the best line right there. <laughs> uh, Robin Sloan, who, who uh, is a best-selling author, actually, got into this game. He wrote uh, Mr. Penumbra's... Uh, who knows the title of this? forgetting anyway Robin Sloan is an author and he made uh, like a fork of Adam um, that lets you basically collaborate with a with the charter and to, to write books so basically he's writing sci-fi right and he, he writes some text looking back she saw and then he asked the network for recommendations that that yeah nothing but a bearded prisoner yeah okay good good enough right so standing on the launch pad Waving goodbye. Take us home, she said to the nav computer. The computer said, keep out of the way, Jenny. Is he using the entire body of the text, or is it oh, just like the I think it's last. just state, you know, conditioning on the state, and whatever. It just continues to condition as it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, OK, so. Some, these are some of the char and implementations, and uh, we'll actually do a short tutorial of this, but we'll take a break first. Uh, before we take a break, well, let me just see what's going on. Yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, before we take a break, let's just see how this came out. So remember, we conditioned on, we, we ran this on NIPS, the scene scoop. So let's see how that, so what that is. Um, how do you turn off the wrap, word wrap? How do you turn off the wrap? Does anyone know? Oh, okay, never mind. A close-up of a red and white flower. A bunch of different colored vase on display. A bunch of kites that are in the air. Colorful kites. Toothbrushes in the glass. A piece of cake on the table. Close-up of a person holding a pair of scissors. I want to see what these scissors... Why well, it keeps on finding scissors. A birthday cake with a train on it. <laughs> That's great. That's surreal, right? Like, this would be a great idea for, like, a surrealist painter to get ideas from. Close-up of a small stuffed animal. Just goes on like this, basically. Okay, so let's take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we will con we will show you how to do char RNN. And also uh, show you some more exotic things that you can do with RNNs. Yeah. What we'll do now is um, show a few implementations of CharRNN, and, and, and a few of you have already run this, so this is probably going to be like relatively repetitive. I'll go through it really quickly, but for those who haven't used it, CharRNN is super easy, um, and there's, there's, I think, more than just two of these implementations online. I'm gonna show you the two that I'm familiar with, but, I'm, but I think there's probably a lot more out there. <clears throat> the the original one was more or less the one by Karpathy, and then that was kind of updated by Justin Johnson as Torch RNN, and that is written to be worked with Torch. That's the original Torch and Lua, not PyTorch. Um, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter because we're using it from the command line, but um, but that's infrastructurally speaking, that's how it is. I've actually gotten in the habit of using the TensorFlow version just because the paper space templates are set up with TensorFlow right away, um, and whereas the Torch installation is kind of broken there for some reason. Um, so I'll just show you that one, but in principle they both work almost exactly the same way. Um, I've already opened, um, so first of all let me just actually go into this, right? So you can see what this is like. Uh, let me actually put this into, 
into Firefox. So, yeah, multi-layer recurrent neural networks, LSTM, um, and it has a relatively simple use case. Basically, there's um, there's two functions here, train and sample, that we want to use. Train is for training, sample is for sampling. So you train and then you can sample infinitely. And, um, and basically, you need to prepare a folder with an input text file. And um, yeah, that could be anything we want. So like, let's actually do that. Um, I'm inside of Jupyter Lab. I've this is I've I've SSH'd into my paper space, and so now I'm inside of Jupyter Lab. Um, so I'm gonna open terminal here, and I'm going to git clone our um, charnn TensorFlow. Then we can go into that. It's really small. And we can actually look at the Python train of pi dash dash help. Okay, this will tell, give us all the options. <clears throat> so first, we have to give it the name of a directory that has a file called input.txt. So for example, if we go into the example, which is data tiny Shakespeare, data tiny Shakespeare input.txt, what is this? This is all of the combined works of Shakespeare. in one big text file. Really deromanticizes the whole Shakespeare thing, right? Does it, to see it like this? Just a whole bunch of lines. Um, why don't we find a text file? Um, what would be a cool text file? Um, sorry? The Bible. The Bible, of course. As always, any, any others? We always do the Bible. <laughs> you do something else. The script of the Godfather. Um, Godfather screenplay text. Are there real art and Olive Garden commercial transcripts? Are, are there? I don't know. I'm Googling it now. The problem is this may not be that big, actually. Um, let's see how big this is. Two hundred kilobytes, not quite enough. Maybe we can add some more films. Like, how about Goodfellas? Well, we could do all three of them. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Fine. Godfather. <laughs> so yeah, let's go into this. That. And um, part two, now we need part three. Does part three even count though? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Okay, how big is that now? 600 kilobytes. It's enough to, to do a demonstration. So, so let's do it. We're not gonna train for long enough to, to really have anything, but why not? Okay, so basically we'll make a folder in here called Godfather. Um, new folder, Godfather. And we put a file in there called input.txt. So I'll just transfer this over there. And then we will rename it to input.txt. So now we go into this and basically we'll go Python train.py in uh, data dir is going to be data godfather and uh, save dir is where is it going to put the checkpoint so like we can make our own we can go save dir godfather check um, and then uh, yeah this okay log log dir we don't care about that that's just putting the logs we can put it in the default location it saves an epoch, uh, saves a checkpoint every thousand. That's fine. In it from if you want to retrain from another model, um, we'll use an LSTM. We can make the RNN. Si These are the parameters that control the the characteristics of the actual RNN of the training. So um, we'll use the defaults for now. But 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 you but just to give you some clues, like if you make the RNN size or the number of layers bigger or both. 
you're basically making the network bigger, which means it'll take longer to train. However, it has more capacity. So in theory, it should um, be better at modeling uh, that data set. Now there's a danger, uh, there's a cost to having a large network, which is that your, your chances of overfitting become higher. Uh, because you're giving the network so much capacity that it might just memorize the whole book, right? So that's something that you have to deal with, and, and there's ways of um, of regularizing that, which I don't know if this actually gives exposes. Um, I'm not actually sure that it does. Um, sequence length is what is the uh, basically yeah the length of the number of time steps to unroll for each uh, for each batch for each pass through the batch. For the most part, you don't really have to mess with this. Like, if you make it bigger, then th that in theory should also improve the quality of the network. Batch size is a little bit more like um, it, it's not necessarily like a bigger batch size is not necessarily better. In theory, um, it should become a little better at, at long term dependencies, but in practice, I don't think it really does. Uh, and the number of epochs will make that bigger, so we'll make it like let's make it like 300 or something. Um, and we'll leave the others as they are. I think that's fine, more or less. So then we'll do num epochs, and we'll say 300. So what's going to happen is I'm going to hit this, and if everything goes well, it should just begin to um, it should begin to train in a moment. So reading the text file, it has to pre-process the text file. So first, it takes all of the unique characters to learn the vocabulary, and then it, yeah, it begins to train. So we can kind of figure out how long this will take. It's going at about 0.33 seconds, uh, 0.03 seconds. So it's doing like 30 iterations per second. Um, so yeah, like I don't know how long this will take. This will this will take like an hour or something. Um, but but in any case, like if you go to data, you'll see that now inside of Godfather, there's two additional files: data that npy and vocab that PKL. What these are is vocab is, is actually, that's a pickle file, so you can unpickle it and see. It's just an array that contains all of the unique characters that were found. This is really important because, okay, in the when you're training, it has to turn all of the characters into one hot vectors. So how are those, so how many, how big is the one hot vector, right? Well, it depends on the number of unique characters in your, um, in your text. And then the vector is uh, like each element of the vector is assigned to one particular character. So it has to figure that out first, and then uh, that's inside of the vocab, and then inside of data, that just that's just all of the actual characters turned into a gigantic NumPy array. So now the characters, instead of being characters, are is just a list of, of one hot vectors for each of the, uh, the different uh, characters that appear in the script. Um, while it's training, I'll just mention a few other things like, um, Another thing that's useful to know is that you can, for example, let's say you want to train on a um, on a small data set, right? Because maybe maybe you found something, but it's kind of small. And this is kind of small, right? One thing you can do is something called transfer learning. And transfer learning, okay, we've been talking about transfer learning. In the context of text, what that would mean is that you train char RNN on some large text corpus, let's say Wikipedia or something like that. And then it gets the gist of the language. And then you can swap out Wikipedia for your smaller text and then fine tune it so that it learns the qualities of that text. And you're kind of bootstrapping off of the language model that you acquired from Wikipedia so that you're able to train it uh, for less time at a lower learning rate so that um, you're able to kind of leverage the bigger text but still get the qualities of the smaller text. So this is kind of a common theme to do. If you end up doing that, there's two things that you have to look out for. One is that you should turn down the learning rate when you start the second run because it'll, it just ends up erasing basically the first one if you don't um, by a factor of maybe 10 or 100, something like that. And you can do that. That's, in the, that's one of the arguments, learning rate. And the other thing is, if there are any characters that appear in the second text that did not appear in the first text, they won't work. You'd have to remove those because basically then it'll try to update the vocab and it's like, or it doesn't try to update the vocab, you're using the same vocab model, but, um, but it finds illegal characters. And so the best way to get around that is to like make a copy of the small text and put it and just slip it into the big text so that it gets all of those characters or you can get all the, you know, 
you can maybe find the characters that are in you you can deal with this method however you wish like that's one easy way of doing it it's just put the, embed the second text in the first one and then it'll pick it up or you know just find the characters and just like slip them into the text um otherwise yeah you'll have problems um now this is obviously training very fast like it's already 10 um 654 th it's already like one percent of the way through we're not gonna have time to finish it but like what i want to do is maybe let it run for a while and show you some other stuff and then come back and we'll, we can sample from it and see how it works after like 30 to 45 minutes of training um because it's not going to be that good like these really should go for like at least 12 hours or something like that if you want to get decent results this won't be that good anyway because it's too small but um but at least we'll get to see you know some pseudo godfathery type text in just a little bit um yeah Uh, be careful because because you may not notice it decaying because because the the loss is um, like 1.32 and 1.31 you don't know what the difference between those is um, it's actually it, it's actually more significant than you think it may stop at some point but but you may not see it just by reading these things you may want to monitor it you can use tensorboard for example to monitor the loss as it goes down but yeah if the loss stops coming down then yeah you're not really gaining anything by training it longer. Um, but but uh, it will be careful because you may not notice small differences. It, it, it tends to go down very slowly, um, obviously over many hours. So, yeah. So you still recommend going many hours on? You can certainly monitor the loss. Uh, also, by the way, this is showing us the training loss, which is a little misleading because you don't necessarily want the training. Like the training loss, if the training loss is zero, then you're in trouble. Um, that means it's overfit. Um, so really, it's the validation loss. Although I don't know if it's doing validation actually. I don't think it is. Um, in fact, um, is there another question? Someone? Oh, okay. Um, so let's do this. I'm gonna let this train for a while, and we'll go back to the slides and and um, talk a little bit more about other things, and then we'll go back to Charin. Uh, yeah, sequence to sequence. Okay. So I wanted to like uh, also show you um, sketch RNN, and of course, like we've we've you've probably seen this around. This it's a nice sort of project by David Ha, primarily by David Ha and, and Douglas Eck at um, Google Brain. Uh, well, actually, I guess Douglas is at Magenta. Uh, but in any case, like, basically, um, David Ha has been doing a lot of really, uh, this is hard murder on Twitter. He's been doing a lot of work um, with, like, vectors, vector drawings. Um, I'll show you kanji, like, neo kanji in a, a little bit also, which is a cool project that's related to this. But in, about a year year ago or so, he released they released Sketch RNN, which is basically a um, a uh, a recurrent neural network model, encoder decoder type model that we that we um, saw in the language translation example, uh, which is used to learn a representation of vector drawings. Uh, right, so these are not pixels; these are actually uh, lines, draw, line draw, line drawings, and uh, this came about because Google created first a, an, exper an AI experiment called QuickDraw, which would let you draw a thing, you know, it says draw a toaster. And then, you know, a person would draw a toaster and then it would, it would try to predict what it was. This was a way for Google to get like billions of drawings. Um, so they, they have a data set that they eventually released online called QuickDraw. And this might be worth, worth for, just for general, generally speaking, might be worth looking into for some of you because QuickDraw is an awesome, like gigantic data set of drawings by people. Um, there was like some really cool analysis that was done of the QuickTry data set by a number of people who um, were kind of like looking at how people in different countries draw different objects. Um, so I don't know if any of you saw that kind of stuff. So like, for example, everyone draws um, certain things the same way everywhere. Uh, but then they draw in like in what are the examples I'm trying to come up with? Um, yeah, in the fish, for example. So they showed like how do people draw fish? And in most of the world, you you'll see that like some people draw fish facing left, some people draw fa fish facing right, and you'll have sort of like just um, a mishmash, like an average. But in some countries, it's always facing right. 
um, because people always draw the fish facing right. And then in like three countries, namely, uh, I think like Japan, India, and like Burma or something like that, or Myanmar, um, maybe Korea, um, the fish are always facing left. Um, and uh, and like who knows why? Like I don't, I don't know if anyone ever got to the to the uh, the Indian case why. Uh, for the case of Japan, I think someone chimed in and said it's because fish are always served facing left on the plate in Japan, something like that. Um, but um, but yeah, it's really cool stuff. So it's like okay, maybe maybe we can find this like how people draw around the world, quick draw. Someone did a blog post on this. I want to say, yeah, yeah. These are what the drawings are like. Some up here. Oh yeah, here we go. So it's like, okay, how do you get out of this? Hide. Yeah, chairs in Korea are facing left, and in Brazil and Australia, they're sort of just like averaged. <laughs> Number of scoops in ice cream. So Italy, always three scoops. <laughs> Stars. Stars are almost the same everywhere, right? Um, there was another blog post somewhere. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is. Is this the one? Oh yeah, this is really neat. How do people draw circles? Okay. I'm trying to find like the. This is still not exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, we'll have to look at this like, okay, fish. <laughs> there must be like... Anyway, you can download the data online. Um, yeah. Okay, I can't find the blog post, but... Yeah. Do they do the analysis on, on the vector or on, the, on vectors? No, on vectors. Okay. This is, yes. Char, it's a sketch, a sketch RNN it's on the vectors. Um, so how does this actually work um, now again like we don't need to go into the details but this is actually just like the, the model broken out that's used by sketch RNN and it's actually like although it looks kind of scary it's basically what we what we've been looking at in in terms of like RNN sequence uh, RNN sequence to sequence models so you have kind of like the RNN there, okay there's kind of like there's an encoder on the left and the decoder on the right. So the encoder on the left is a multi-layer multi LSTM. Actually, it's not an LSTM per se, but it's what's called a hyper network, which is some other stuff that um, that David Ha worked with, which is a type of LSTM cell, I suppose. I'm actually not 100% sure. He does. There are links in here for, for all that. But basically, it's it's a it's a multiple-layer LSTM cell that encodes a sequence of of uh, like you know pen positions, right? Sequence of, of vectors, uh, so, sorry, a sequence of vertices into an encoding. And then that encoding uh, is, can then be decoded into another, into a, ras uh, sorry, not, into another sequence of vectors. So basically it's like an autoencoder, right? You have the encoder and the decoder. The encoder takes the sequence of of vertices and encodes it into a single vector which characterizes that drawing. And then the decoder takes in a latent encoding and decodes it into a sequence of, of vertices that can then be drawn. Now, and then the way that the way that the system is trained is that it's trained, okay, so you have, you know, however million, millions of drawings you you train the network so that whenever you input a single drawing it will it will reconstruct it and the output so the encoder encodes it and the decoder decodes it and it tries to get it as close as possible to the original and you do this for you know millions of them now the reason why you do this is then you acquire this it's just the same reason why we do do it with an autoencoder you acquire this representation which can characterize all of the drawings as a sort of vector of high level high level representation like a vector that characterizes it uh, which can be modulated right it's a latent vector so you can you can do all sorts of things with it you'll see we'll see examples of that in a moment 
Um, but yeah, that's basically the system that they use to draw it. So, okay, so like what happens, right? So once it's trained, they can take a, a, like a drawing by a human and run it, through the in, run it through the encoder, take the latent vector, then then run it through the decoder, and then get, get the reconstruction. So what happens is that it turns all of these human drawings into their, into their reconstruction. The reconstruction is slightly different than the, um, than the original, right? Because it loses some information. And in particular, it loses, it loses distinguishing information, right? Because the whole idea is that it has, to, it has to find the essential aspects of these things. And so it, it tends to lose the idiosyncrasies. Um, you can actually use these to clean up drawings, basically, because it's kind of like, it, you know, that's what autoencoders are actually quite good at, is getting rid of noise. Um, now, you might think that it's just memorizing them, right? But, it's, but they do, they have some experiments that show like, okay, what's, what's actually going on here? It's learning, um, so like, okay, for example, if you take a cat and you draw it with three eyes, and then you run it through, and then it reconstructs it, it reconstructs it with two eyes, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't, the model does not understand cats with three eyes. And so it kind of, it's, it's kind of a, it's like a denoising autoencoder. It denoises like, you know, it takes, you know, aberrations and it, and it smooths them into what it expects. So here's another example. If you draw a toothbrush, right? This is a, this is a model that's trained only on cat drawings. So if you throw in a toothbrush, it turns it into a cat-like toothbrush, or sorry, a toothbrush-like cat. Right, so, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand, are these still sequential? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. being put in still, uh, like first I draw the circle, the head. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are, they are sequential, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not drawing them here, I'm not animating them, but we'll, we'll see later uh, with that. Okay. Uh, so, um, Okay, so like, what else can you do with these? So for example, let's say, say you take two human inputs, okay, the a cat face and the cat, or a pig body, cat face, pig body. You can encode each of the drawings and take their latent vectors, and then you can do an interpolation between their latent vectors. You take all of those latent vectors between the two, uh, the two encoded ones from the two human inputs, you interpolate between them and you throw those onto the decoder and you get the drawing for each of the, you know, you basically get an interpolation between these. This is exactly like, uh, as I showed with GANs, like, to, and, and autoencoders two weeks ago, you know, you get this latent, uh, latent vector associated with the image that you can then do interpolations between. We do this with eigenfaces also. And this is just the same here, except that the cell is not a, is not a, um, uh, is not just a feedforward neural network, but it's actually a, a an LSTM cell. So it actually can, operate with sequences, um, but otherwise it's the same concept. Right? So you get a gener gradual interpolation from cat face to pig body. Um, so another like pig face to, to pig body, right? gradually, gradually changing. And you see that like it, it kind of tries to have a plausible looking drawing at every part of, at every stage of the way. They also, this is really cute. And this is the cutest thing you've ever seen in a research paper. <laughs> So you can do these, of course, like, you know, remember when we did this whole thing with the sunglasses, like, okay, man minus man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses, things like that. You can do that here too. So they'll take the latent vector associated with just the cat face and add the uh, pig body minus pig face, right? So what, what does that do? So that's cat plus pig uh, <laughs> like okay, the vector between you subtract, you add the vector that goes from a face to a body, and so you get a cat body, right? So cat face plus pig body minus pig face equals cat body, yeah. And so, and so yeah, this is this is super super neat, uh, yeah. Is the, the mathematical um, sort of I guess procedure that's going on behind the scenes, is that still just basic vector and dimensional vector ge uh, geometry? Like uh, yeah, 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 just adding, just element-wise adding, yeah. The interpolation uh, between them might be a little funky, so usually you don't do a linear interpolation because um, because it's kind of unnatural. It would go through parts of the, gen the latent space that are actually undersampled. So usually what we do is like a spherical interpolation, slurp, sometimes you'll call it. You'll call it. But don't worry about it, it's like details, and it's in the notebooks anyway. 
um, so this is another example. So this is on uh, people did drawings of yoga. So here's an interpolation between two different yoga positions. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, right? This person's face switches his face goes to his butt. Like <laughs> Yeah, so that that was really neat. Uh, he also, before this, this was kind of the precursor to all this, he did a project called Neo Kanji, or Kanji RNN, and this is basically a sketch RNN type model that was trained on SVGs of Chinese characters. And, um, and so then, does anyone here read Chinese? Try to read those characters? <laughs> yeah, none of them make any sense, right? So they're fake, right? They're basically like... It's just a, it read all these like SVGs of Chinese characters and then it started making up its own. And he actually has a, a Twitter account called Neo Kanji, um, which just like would draw these fake characters and then it would also like give them a name. Bumpy Road. This is the character for Bumpy Road. Urban Sheep. Hot Fish. Kanji Morph Test. From turtle to book, turtle to book. Oh yeah, so he has a latent space. It's neat, a lot of neat stuff. Really, really neat, cute project. Let's look at some demos. We can actually run these in the browser, um, and you can, if you want to, you can follow this along. I will, I'll, I'm only going to look at it briefly because let's see how we're doing. Two twenty. Okay, we're actually getting pretty close to the end here. Uh, I don't have too much more to show you, so you might be finishing up early for a change. Um, but. Um, but let's look at this demo. So, so they, um, let me just remember. Okay, I showed you IM text. I'm just thinking out loud. I showed you IM text. I'm going to show you Charn. I'll show you this. I think that's all the demos for today. Yeah. So, um, this is a notebook and collab that you can connect to. You can search for this you could, if you want to find this. It's like a Sketch RNN, you know, probably Sketch RNN notebook. Oh, I have to sign in. Oh, let me actually uh, hang on a second. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, oh, I'm still not signed in. Okay, fine. <laughs> Is it secure to show your, your password being it so that now like my, it's known how many characters my password is? Like, should I? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna censor that actually, like uh, when, the, when I make the video. Okay, anyway, um, you can, we can connect to this. And um, so now we can run through it. So let's import some of the code. Oh, sure, that's fine. Okay, connected, run, install some stuff. We can just kind of go through the stuff really fast. So the first function that he defines is basically a drawing function. So that'll take a sequence of vectors. And this factor, the smaller it is, the bigger it gets drawn. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so you don't really have to read through this. I mean, it's just like, it's just using some SVG, like canvas library to draw, to draw vectors. Um, so yeah, we can kind of let that, yeah, it has to install some stuff. So in the, initially you have to install a bunch of libraries. That's all done here. Okay. So magenta gets imported, run through that. Here's the data directory and you can change. So this is a sheep directory. This is from Aaron Koblen's sheep project because they got a whole bunch of people to draw sheep. And so then they made a database out of that. This is where the models are located. You don't have to change this, but there's actually some others um, that you may want to play with if you want. I forget where they're listed though. I think there's like a ostrich one or something like that. And of course the cat one um, and some others. So okay, so we'll load this and then, um, okay, some more. This loads the model. Run that, and now this will load the actual data set. Did I do something wrong? No such file. What's going on here? 
Oh, I have to download it. Right, okay. Download, run this, open. Yes. Okay. This creates the model. This actually creates the model. This begins a TensorFlow session, the next one, and loads the checkpoint. Encoder, boom. Decoder, boom. Okay, so now we can get a random sample from this from the uh, data set, and it'll draw it. And if you want, I think this you can do a fact make the factors like if you make a factor smaller, it'll make it'll draw it bigger. Oh, is that not right? Maybe it's. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, it's a little too big. Big big sheep. Okay, that's a little better. There's a sheep. There's another sheep. So um, if we we can encode this, so first of all, that's the stroke. It'll just show us the stroke. Um, but then but then we have this z. We can actually look at we can inspect z. So I add a thing here. We can look at z. Z is nothing more than an array. I think it's I think it's a hundred dimension. A dimension of a hundred. So then z. 128. So there's z. That's the encoding of that particular vector, right? So um, so now what we can do is like uh, let's see. Um, so then we take z and we can decode it, which means draw make a new sheep from that encoding. So if we run this, it's going to encode this and then decode it, and that's the decoder. It looks like almost the same actually, which is yeah. Wait, this doesn't make any sense. Wait, I gotta see something. If you draw strokes. Oh, okay, right, because the temperature gets changed. So, like, um, DZ. So this should work. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Well, I guess it really does have that much randomness in it. The temperature controls a lot. Um, but why is the encoding? It seems like hardly maps. But okay, that's basically that. And then we can make an interpolation between two. So this will decode. You see that it basically does 10 times. And then it add, it does decodes. Oh, sorry. This is not an interpolation. This is just drawing it at 10 different temperatures. So this goes from very predictable to very random. It takes a while because there's 10 of them now. The other thing we can do, I don't, yeah, this does have an interpolation. Yeah, so this goes from very predictable to very random. Latent space interpolation between zero, z0 zero and zero 01. Okay, so we basically get two z vectors. So that's z0 is our original. And then we sample a new one and make that z1. So here's z0 and z1. It's this and that. And so now we can interpolate between them. So we come up with a list of z's that are basically spherically interpolated between z0 and z1. So we grab that. So we can actually like we can inspect that. So here's Z list. Right, so there's there's now a list of ten of these where each one is interpolating between the two endpoints. So now we can go here and it'll do a reconstruction at all of these. We can change the temperature maybe, but or right, well, let's see how it is at the default temperature. I think it's like 0 0.8 or something. Reconstruction for each vector in Z list. So this will interpolate between, for all of these 10, uh, it, it'll interpolate between those two endpoints. Uh, where is it? Reconstructions dot make grid, oh, okay, make grid SVG. So this will draw them. Right? So that goes between this and that. 
So the original endpoints were this and that. It doesn't seem to be that correspondent. I think because maybe the temperature should be like really low. Like okay, if we maybe say the let's set the temperature to be temperature was zero point zero one. Let's try that. This might actually come out really boring, possibly, but let's see. Um, so now I'll run this. Hmm, less boring than I thought, but okay. Like a little more, a little less chaotic, I suppose. Another thing you could do, this notebook doesn't have it, but you can do arithmetic on these, right? So we could say like, okay, I could sample a random, right, go down here, and I can sample, let's say like three, we take three random, like random samples, let's say two, three, and then we encode each of them. So we get these three Zs, and then what I can do is, Okay, so like we can draw each of them. Okay, so that's that's zero, one, and two. Sorry, one, two, and three. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, just draw. These are the decoded versions, right? And so we could do like, for example, I could do uh, Z four equals Z one plus z2 minus z3 and then we can try to decode z4 right and we can maybe let's draw it a little bigger um, so let's run that right so that's that's this minus sorry this plus this minus that <laughs> not that. So this would make a little more sense, obviously, if you have more salient characteristics that you're that you're trying to, to do arithmetic on. Uh, but you can see that the syntax is actually really simple, which is nice. They had this continues with the flamingo model, so we can we can like look at that really briefly. If you want to see what a flamingo looks like to a neural net. Just a quick question. Yeah. Um, that works because you have a vector multiplicator addition library installed, or is that just built in Python? Audition is definitely built into Python, yeah. Well, but with, with these long, long oh, sure, yeah, yeah, you can do addition and list, yeah. Um, so yeah, here's some flamingos. So you could do this whole process on flamingos if you want. It has an owls, owl LSTM. Look at that, it's beautiful. There's a random owl. It's cute, right? Um, interpolating between two different owls. So just redrawing, retracing all these steps. That's neat. It's got the cat buses, cats and buses. So yeah, you can, you can, you kind of get the idea. So this goes from cat to bus. Cat bus, elephants, elephant to cat. That's great, right? So that's really, that's super neat, right? So you got that. And actually, uh, at my understanding is that um, SketchRNN was just, ML5 has uh, just merged uh, the SketchRNN example. I don't know if it's up on the website yet, but it's, it's, it is, ML5 now has SketchRNN. Oh, another thing we can actually show is the demo. So, they have an online demo. This is using uh, TensorFlow.js. So what's going on here is that you load a, you know, okay, like let's load the, let's load the cat model. So it's loading the cat model and it goes, start drawing a cat. So let's do this. Isn't that cool? So it completes your drawing. Right, because it's a it's a LSTM, so basically you just input the first half of the of the of the sequence, and then it will complete it for you. So this is really cool. This is the basis for like a sort of collaborate with a machine on drawing stuff. So there's the. Let's try another one. If I like, 
What if we just draw like some legs? It figures it out, huh? Maybe, um, how about this? <laughs> that makes more sense. Yeah, it, actually, it's a little hard to like, okay, like if I... Let's try another. What do you guys want to see? Passport. That's, that's, what is an anti yoga? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, now you know how people. What if we. Wait, okay, what if we, like, um... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Dog bunny. It's more of a bunny bunny, I suppose, right? What's a dog bunny? Pig sheep. Alarm clock. Um, what's an alarm clock like? Crab, rabbit, face pig. Mermaid. Oh, yeah, I think I really confused it just now. Like, okay, what if I just like... <laughs> That's brilliant, right? You guys get the idea. So it's really fun. And I think basically ML5 should have this built in pretty soon. Um, and so it's pretty easy to get this kind of stuff up and running. Um, or easier than it used to be anyway. Just a few more projects and then, and then we'll get back to Char and N. Um, this, was, this is really cool. This was... Um, made by Magento a few, I think just a few weeks ago. So it's basically um, Piano Genie. So what it does is it takes a whole bunch of MIDI sequences, right? MIDI is another sequence uh, of different piano pieces and it encodes them into a simpler, it gives you like a, it's another encoder decoder thing, you know, LSTM encoder decoder. And then you get a latent a representation of all of these melodies, like which is sort of a simplified version of the, of the piece. And so then you can hook up a piano to it where you like play really simple lines and it com auto completes it for you sort of into like a much more com uh, like, okay, well, let's just show you an example. It's really cool. So let's, let's look at this, right? Piano genie improvisation. So he has an eight button controller. pretty fun right um, yeah and they show how that works and it's basically it's very similar to the same stuff that we've been showing basically LSTM encoder decoder um, handwriting demo and this is this is one of the original things made by Alex Graves who's one of the like um, really developed LSTMs quite a bit so like we can go like hello we are at ITP today learning about recurrent neural networks so style let's pick that uh, increasing bus makes sample more legible but less diverse um, let's give it a go free samples 
So now it's going to write them as an online demo. So it runs them to, I suppose, some server. This is really old school, I think. Um, so, oh, this might take a little while. <laughs> I wonder if it's even still working, actually. Hmm, seems to be working. Okay, I'm not, oh, there we go. Wait, did it do anything? Uh, no. No, it's not actually. Okay, I don't know, maybe it's not working. Random style? Okay, maybe the demo's broken. The point is that it would draw that draw what you were in in uh, it would write that text in handwriting style. Um, so that's really neat, Alex Graves. Um, this is more recent. I, I don't actually know too much about how this works, but but it's worth looking into. Um, and it does appear to have some code associated with it. Although I don't think they have a pre-trained model, so this might make it really hard actually. But in any case, they trained like what looks to be like a really, really, really good story generation from prompts. So um, there's like a, a Reddit channel called Writing Prompts where people practice creative writing by being given a prompt and then writing something about it. And so they scraped that channel for a whole bunch of prompts and writing pieces and then trained it to, to be able to write something from a prompt. And so someone goes, the scientists have discovered something terrible. That's the prompt. And then, okay, here's the story. That's generated by the network. The scientist stood there a little dazed as he stared. What is it, he asked. This, this thing, this is a virus, a chemical that can destroy an entire planet, and it is a very small, complex chemical that could destroy any planet, the scientist replied. His lab assistant looked down at the tablet. It's really coherent, right? So this stuff is getting a lot, lot better at writing coherent texts, right? So we, we're usually dealing with char RNN, which is pretty dinky, but it turns out that these things can actually, like, um, they're getting to be much more salient and um, this also makes me think of like the duplexes if anyone saw those things that Google released like a few a few months ago now these AI AIs as we call them like that would call up pizza restaurants and you know make it make an order for delivery and then they would be completely like no one would know that they're robots like ordering pizza so they're and they're able to interact with human beings effectively so they're getting to be pretty good like a lot of natural language tasks are actually like falling to the machines slowly so um so yeah uh that's something to look up i don't know if it's actually what it, it's it may not actually even be using an lstm for all i know uh, it may actually be like because there's ways of generating text with covnets believe it or not um but i'm not sure actually what this is it's probably an lstm though um, it's worth, we're not going to get into this in much detail. I would really recommend reading this article um, about like different sort of variations and, and additions and, and, and uh, you know, things that have been added to LSTMs and RNNs in general that are worth knowing about. One of the sort of hottest new things in machine, in deep learning over the last like two or three years or so that's, that's come developed is the concept of attention. So attention is it's kind of what it sounds like, right? Like when you are trying to describe something and you're, let's say you're asked to describe something that you're looking at, well, you don't look at the whole thing all at once and like take it all in. You kind of like your eyes go around and look at parts of it as you, you know, because some parts are more important in a certain context than other parts. And so this is important for, for neural networks too. Like this notion of attention is like, you have some data, how do you sort of, um, focus on, on one aspect of it. And, um, and uh, oh, so for example, like, yeah, attention is used more or less to, um, to guide these drawing robots where it's zooming in on like some particular part of the canvas and then drawing numbers from left to right or from right to left. Um, you need attention, for example, in order to like uh, read street address numbers. That was one of their first uses because they might be written diagonally Right? It's like, how do you know which order to read them in? So that's something that actually has to be trained. And also attention is useful for a lot of neural translation tasks. So like this shows uh, English to French translation and each of the tokens are paying attention or each of the words are paying attention to, to some subset of the other words across the, right? So like, for example, okay, the is just la, right? But then economic 
um, is paying attention to like this whole block here, like zo uh, European economic zone. So you see these three kind of go together um, because yeah, like different, there's of course context can be over a long term, right? So this, this isn't a good example, but if, if for example, we were doing the French example, like French and France, you might see a connection, you know, between French and France, like the word for what is the next language It's actually looking not just at, not just at that position in the, in the sentence that, it, that is being translated, but also way back in the beginning of the sentence when it made some reference to it. Um, and also something really cool to know about is, uh, oh yeah, like neural Turing machines. I haven't heard very much about these in the last few years. These seem like really hot stuff, like two or three years ago. I don't know if anyone's really been developing them recently, but they seem like really interesting and promising. The idea of a neural Turing machine is to basically emulate a Turing machine, you know, like basically a computer um, within an entire LSTM. And the, you know, LSTMs are, you can think of them now as processors, but they uh, can also be imbued with some notion of memory, right? And how would you, how do you do memory in the neural network? That seems really foreign because memory is fundamentally like a discrete thing. You think of memory like RAM is like, you know, you have some data that's kind of sitting there discreetly and neural networks have to be continuously differentiable. So how do you make memory differentiable? The, uh, the answer is you, you basically sort of, you make them, you make it so that like when you read and write operations, you are actually reading a whole long vector. Like you're updating all of the cells. You're just updating them by zero or one, right? So like you, you basically hack it as a, some sort of a, the, the point is that using, using architectures like this, you can have, um, long-term data arrays to look at, look up, you know, you can form, you can form like a bank of facts that you could hold on to. Right. And this seemed like maybe the path towards making like, like uh, essentially like agents, you know, that, that, that have some notion of memory built into them and in, anything that we can do with a computer, um, you know, potentially can be modeled as an LSTM this way. And the other thing that's worth knowing about these, um, uh, what else is it? There's, uh, I can't remember what else I wanted to say about them. Well, in any case, they, they've kind of died down. Like I haven't heard very much about them. I don't know if people really just are having trouble making them work, but it's essentially like an LSTM on, on steroids or something like that. Um, again, like very much worth reading. Um, okay, so that's actually the end of the slides. Let me quickly show you char RNN. Let, let's see the sampling as it's going. And, um, and then we'll, we'll, we're actually uh, finished up a little early today. Oh, we finished. Okay, so let's try to sample. So um, sample, so that would be in sample.py. Oh, we get, we actually just, okay, so let's Python sample.py help. Okay, so save directory, that's where is the model that the checkpoint that you're looking up, right? So we saved it into um, godfather check. And then n is the number of samples. So you could do Python sample.py. Save there is godfather check. N is how many characters? Let's say a thousand, 500 by default. And the prime will leave it as empty. The, uh, that's like you can input a sequence to, to start it, but let's just give it a, let's just see, um, see what this does. So this probably is not gonna be that good because we only trained it for like an hour. But it should, we should get um, the site goings. Mary, no history. We bought my new sir join. Yeah, it's still pretty bad. But you notice all the new line characters and stuff. These are being rendered. Uh, but you can actually fix, it, fix this if you just go into sample.py and then you don't encode this. You just remove that. Now, it, now it'll actually just like, um, let's make like 5,000. Now it'll actually render it. Five thousand characters. There it is, Michael, Al Greed of the men with he bullet in the join eight pecked him. I father wanted now is Michael. Whoa, get me like you. That's not bad after one hour, right? So it learned some names: Fabrizio, Fredo, 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 Salazzo. Right? It gets their names, um, and uh, Michael, of course. 
So it doesn't. It's not making a lot of sense right now, and a lot of. But you see a lot of words kind of coming coming in there. I think after twelve hours or so, and with a bigger text, it would be a lot better. Um, another thing you can do is you can prime it. So let's do a thousand characters, and if you do dash prime, we can actually put in a string to start out with. So um, it's like it's like uh, inputting uh, a sequence to start with, and then conditioning the network to complete it. So so I could be like. Um, Come to me on the day of, let's try that, uh, oh, did I do it wrong? Oh, dash dash prime. All right, let's see. Come to me in the day of, what do you think? You think it'll get it? Okay, let's go to the top there. Come to me on the day of the father. That's close, that's close. Tom to Lafton, son about you, yeah. So not bad, right? Not too bad at all. Okay, so that's Charn and TensorFlow. Oh, oh, another thing, there's another thing you can look at. It's like um, sampling strategy. Um, what is it like? Uh, if you help. So basically, zero to use max at each time step. So this is like the strategy for sampling. If you have dash dash sample zero says, just pick the maximum at uh, whatever the highest probability character is. Pick it all the time. Um, one is to sample at each time step it is like basically um, not the highest, but sample according to the probability. And then two, it actually works pretty well. I think that uh, is basically sample a random one or according to the probability only after spaces, but then within the word, always pick the, 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 the most probable character because then you get words at least like most likely um, so that's actually like okay like if we tried this to be um, come to me on we could do sample two so this might actually like maybe make this might actually make a little bit more sense because maybe it'll some of the words will make sense but it's super repetitive yeah I don't know and you think what he know we all for Michael yeah it ends up being like the words make sense, but it gets super repetitive. So, so yeah, your your uh, results will vary. Any questions on Char RNN? Okay, some of you have used it. Um, definitely like, uh, um, and of course you can you can use it now in ML5. So that's 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 really awesome as well. Okay, so next week we're gonna get into like language embeddings, word word embeddings, uh, like, uh, and some tasks in natural language processing, and we'll try to make something like this, like the wiki TSNI type thing. I've been kind of modernizing that code. Uh, we'll talk about latent semantic analysis, and we'll probably put in some miscellaneous audio stuff as well. And I'm kind of taking requests. This is a little bit of a hodgepodge week. We'll, we'll like, uh, if anyone has anything that they're interested in that they want to that they want to see in this class, like maybe email me, shoot me an email, and we might try to see if I can work it in. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's more or less what, what we'll have to in store for next week. Are there any questions, comments about today? <clears throat> okay, cool. So uh, like I said, for um, so next week we have this, the week after we're done, and I want you guys to like start thinking about projects and maybe come try to find me and, and, and uh, talk to me about what you're thinking about doing. And uh, office hours tomorrow from basically one, let's say, until the evening. Uh, same thing for Thursday. And, um, and yeah, I'll take it from there. Cool. Are you okay with groups or teams? Group, yeah, yeah, sure. Groups and teams are cool. Um, okay, cool. See you guys next week. Uh, Gene, would you mind looking at the yeah. syntax?